Oh, okay. uh, sorry, YouTube channel. And then it just saved. Yep. Sword. Yep. We can look back and look. Yep. Oh, Nobody? Oh. <laughs> Unfortunate that it's mirrored. I don't think you can do anything about that. Uh, you know what to do about that. <laughs> sorry. No, sorry. Oh. I, I, <laughs> oh. I just the uh, the video is mirrored, and I don't know how to. So everything you put up is in the same reverse. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> come up then like the text will be backwards but pictures all over yeah, yeah, yeah. the mirror image like they still look good uh, yeah uh, right to left left to right left guy still <laughs> yeah still good. look like the mustache yeah <laughs> I 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Like, I was, we were schooling together when we found that we could do this, and that was like. Oh, yeah. We bought the house and the dog Yeah. I'll attend however long you want. Okay. So we have a room for an hour. Yeah, about that. Yeah. 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 Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Well, they won't talk for an hour. I'll talk for three minutes. Yeah, yeah. 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 that would be great. Okay, perfect. Next time. Let's wait a few more minutes. I can't get through here. Oh. <laughs> Your bill, I take it? Yeah. Oh, okay. You can do this. Sure. Okay. Uh, and risk it. Well, I, I did just try, come back to trial and talk the way I'm talking about it. Yeah. Well, I just welcome. Thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks you were just talking to me yesterday? Uh, yeah, I did two talks yesterday and I have another one today after this. Oh, and this is all good. Mitchell tonight, Nine Falls tomorrow. Uh, my beard, <laughs> see me in another couple of months. Sure, see you in another couple of Okay, so um, you've got underway here uh, uh, today as part of the uh, Cold Regions uh, Research Center talk series. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Adam Schultz today. Um, Dr. Schultz did his undergrad at Brock and master's PhD at McMaster? Yes. And um, he's a wide variety of, of interests, research interests in uh, the natural world, uh, history, geography, uh, archaeology um, as well. And and he's uh, uh, an author of several books. Uh, started off, I think, was it Alone Against the North? It's the first book. And then uh, The History of Ten Maps of Canada, which this guy here, I highly recommend you read these. Really great reads and a really great history of how the North was was explored, and and reading through this and thinking of how these early explorers snowshoe 100 kilometers or 100 miles to do things it was just amazing to comprehend uh, in this day and age. But uh, and how the how the North was mapped, and then more recently uh, his book on um, Beyond the Trees, uh, which is a, a his epic 4,000 kilometer solo journey, canoe trip, across the barren lands, the boreal forest, I think ranging from starting an old crow, was it, area of the Yukon, basically traversing across many of the areas that many of the researchers in here have, have worked in, whether uh, we have researchers that have worked in, in the Inuvik area in the barren lands, uh, in the rivers, uh, Great Bear Lake, uh, we have researchers that have worked in the Coppermine River, areas that look like you've gone through. So, that would be very natural to have Dr. Schultz come in and give a presentation on his uh, his book and his uh, journeys and pictures of uh, of uh, his journey across uh, with the book Beyond the Tree. So, uh, so we extend a warm welcome to Dr. Schultz. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Uh, it's very nice to be here on Laurier's campus. Uh, I did do my PhD at McMaster, but I have a Laurier connection. Uh, I actually did part of my PhD with uh, Dr. John Triggs from the archaeology department. And uh, at the time, I thought it was going to be really easy to get permission to come over here to Laurier and work with Dr. Triggs. I mean, McMaster is like half an hour away. And I was amazed by many different levels of bureaucracy. I had to sign off on that mm -hmm. at both Laurier and McMaster, all these different genes that I didn't even know existed. Uh, but anyways, and I know Dr. Glenn Cross. Uh, we've known each other for... I think I met you eight years ago on a dig in Fort Erie, and I've hung out on your digs before as well. So very good. Thank you. I don't think I know anyone else here. Uh, anyway, uh, before I get started, oh yes, uh, yeah, maybe a few of you have actually seen me on digs over the years. Uh, anyways, uh, before we get started, I don't know very much about the Cold Regions uh, Research Center. Is that 
the correct title? Are, are most of you students? Is that, or are you, yeah, you're students, undergrads or, or grad students? And are you from a whole different, bunch of different disciplines? Are you all in geography and earth sciences? Biology. Biology. Oh, biology, mostly in biology? No, mix in biology and geography. Oh, okay. Geography. Is, there, is there anyone from the archaeology department or no? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, okay, very good. <laughs> and are you just here to see me or are you actually part of the whole regions? Oh, you're just here for me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Okay, very good. Uh, well, anyways, uh, my name, as you heard, is Adam Schultz. Uh, I'm explorer in residence with the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. I've been doing expeditions for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society for about 10 years now. And uh, they made me an explorer in residence a couple of years ago, which is kind of an oxymoron since I'm not really resident. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just seem to always be wandering around. And uh, that's me and my Canadian. That's how I normally look. Uh, on my expeditions, I do expeditions in all four seasons. Just came back from one uh, two days ago, uh, up north doing some things. And I'm going to be heading out again for about four months, uh, solo, off the grid in about four weeks. So that's why I appreciate the invitation. It's always nice to get some face-to-face uh, -face interaction before going away for four months uh, by yourself. Anyways, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I do uh, because I had a background in academia. I mean, I did my PhD at McMaster, uh, but I've been outside of academia ever since, um, making my living as a full-time adventurer and a, a popular writer, I guess you would say. And uh, yeah, doing that full-time for about the last five years or so, this is, this is my, uh, my life. And uh, I consider it, you know, looking back how I became an explorer in residence, uh, the greatest good fortune in the world that I just happened to go up, grow up in rural Ontario uh, without any neighbors or any other houses around. I, I lived on an unpaved road with no street lights and no sidewalks, and all around our house, I mean, I look out my bedroom window into these uh, uh, silver maples and sassafras and red oak, but all around us was just a big, swampy, deciduous forest, and uh, that was my first playground, uh, my first classroom, and I spent all the time I could as a youngster uh, out in the woods. I had a real passion uh, for trees and wild plants and lichens and mushrooms, and birds and all the wild things. And uh, that's what that was what I looked like as a kid. Oh, sorry, I didn't plug this in. Uh, yes, I did. Yes, there. That's what I looked like as a kid. Uh, doing this kind of thing, you know, I always loved uh, survival and that sort of thing. Always trying as a kid to make fire without matches, rubbing sticks together. Never seemed to work that well in those days. Uh, but I came from a long line of woodworkers. My father, my grandfather, my great grandfather. Uh, they were all traditional woodworkers, so the kind of people who made uh, grandfather clocks and uh, you know tables and chairs uh, from by hand you know using old uh, hand tools and that was sort of a, a lot of my early childhood memories of doing those sorts of things and my father you know he spent a lot of time teaching my brother and I uh, all the different trees of the forest I remember being quizzed you know in the winter when there was no leaves it was always hard uh, that's a basswood that's a black walnut and what do we do with each different type of tree what's the wood good for you know, a hot horn bean, it's really hard. We'll use that to make our chisel handles for carving. It's not going to split when you hit it with a mallet. And uh, basswood over here in the summer with the big heart-shaped leaves, that's a really soft wood. We'll use that for carving. We're going to carve our, our old man carving or whatever we're doing. And I thought I would show you a few examples of the kind of projects we used to do as kids. Uh, I remember one day I went out into the forest behind our house, and I was looking for a nice big white birch. I had one in mind. I knew where it grew over by the sycamore. And I got the white birch, I took my chisel and my mallet, and I peeled off the bark off the tree, all in uh, one big piece, and I got it down on the forest floor, kind of like a big, long uh, uh, rug of carpet, and I rolled it all up, brought it back to the wood shop, and cut some stakes, and started folding the bark in between there, because we used to always do these kind of projects. And then I went back out in the forest, and I looked for some white ash for gunnels and boards, and then I looked for some eastern white cedar uh, to make some flexible ribs, and I waited for a big windstorm, and I got some uh, white spruce roots for sewing things together. White spruce, really good, the root for sewing. And also some inner bark of the basswood for more twine. And we sewed it together, and uh, we built a birch bark canoe here. And we were always building cedar strip canoes and birch bark canoes and carving paddles. And uh, best of all, when it was finished, that's when I got to have fun uh, taking them out and paddling them as a kid. And that's basically what I still do to this day. I'm still building canoes and I'm still going out and paddling them. And I'm just trying in my own small way uh, to share my passion uh, for Canada's geography, our rivers and lakes, uh, through my books. Uh, I've written a few books, as you heard, Alone Against the North. That's my first book. 
Uh, it's a pretty practical guide to life. It's about all sorts of sensible things like sleeping alone in polar bear territory, all sorts of good career advice. And uh, a history of Canon 10 maps, you heard a little bit about that one. Um, that was actually not my idea. My idea after I wrote this adventure book, it was quite successful. My publisher, they came to me and said, you know, we've been trying for years to get someone to write a book about a history of maps in Canada. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, years earlier over in England, a geography professor, an academic geographer had written a book called The History of the World in 12 Maps. And the publisher thought that that was really a great idea. It was a very successful book, A History of the World, 12 Maps. I don't know if any read it. Uh, but they wanted to do the same thing for Canada. So they wanted someone to write a book called The History of Canada in 12 Maps. And I guess they tried out various academic geographers, but they didn't think it was going to sell. Uh, so they came to me and they said, you're an adventurer. You love the forest. Do you think you could... Uh, you could write this book. And I thought about it for a moment and I said to myself, a history of Canada in 12 maps. Uh, that sounds like a horrible idea for a book. <laughs> Who has time to read a book about 12 maps? I said, make it 10 and I can definitely do it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so it's only 10 maps. Uh, anyways, actually I wrote that book because I always loved Canadian history. I always thought it was really fascinating. I remember as a kid uh, reading all these Canadian history books and I was a little kid. And I loved all the different histories. I mean, I got to study uh, uh, Mayan history. I ended up doing my PhD actually in indigenous history. Uh, but I worked for five years in the classics department because uh, I studied classics as an undergrad. And I, I mean, I loved teaching ancient Rome and ancient Greece. But I kept hearing from all my friends and my colleagues that Canadian history was dull. You know, there wasn't any exciting books. Uh, so I wrote that one uh, to hopefully appeal to people and get them interested in the subject, to lead them into it, down the rabbit hole, uh, that sort of thing. Anyways, I still uh, love rivers and lakes. As I said, that's the theme running through all my books. I love all different rivers, whether it's the Grand River near here or the more isolated rivers. Those are the ones that really get my blood flowing. Uh, rivers like this one here. I took this picture five years ago, and I always think when I see this river, it looks kind of like a giant anaconda, uh, the way it snakes across that subarctic landscape. And you can see, uh, being geographers, most of you and biologists, there's just a little bit of forest cover there, a little bit of tamarack and black spruce on either side of the riverbank. And then beyond that, it's mostly a treeless landscape. It's all that wonderful bog or muskeg uh, stretching as far as the eye can see. And that little bit of white down there that looks almost like patches of snow, uh, that in, is in fact a whole ton of caribou lichen, uh, also known as reindeer moss. Uh, so I go to rivers like this, and usually I'm trying to find the most isolated river I can. So if you have a big map and you spread it out on your desk, and you take a ruler and you start drawing lines, uh, if you can trace them out like a couple hundred kilometers from the nearest airstrip or mine or road or highway or community of any kind, uh, those are the rivers that really put a smile on my face. I like to go to those rivers. I make maps of them for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. As you might have guessed from the title of my one book there, Alone, I'm known for doing my journeys solo. Uh, so that means every year I get to spend months out of the year alone off the grid. Uh, it's what I love to do. And I've done expeditions now in all 10 provinces and three territories, multiple ones in fact. Uh, but the majority of my expeditions going back to when I was a teenager, until when I was in high school in fact, uh, the majority have been in just one area of the map of Canada. Uh, it's maybe not the best known ecosystem or eco region in Canada. Uh, it is, in fact, the biggest wetland in all of North America, approximately the third biggest wetland in the world. Uh, it's the Hudson Bay Lowland. Has anyone been to the Hudson Bay Lowland? Yes, one person, only one, the two, three. Why were you guys shy at first? Looking <laughs> that way. You're looking that way. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And you love the Hudson Bay Lowland, right? Yes. Yeah, you do. Again, you're shy, you're hesitant. Yes. Uh, well, I love the Hudson Bay Lowland. To give you a sense of scale, it's in the subarctic, just south of the Hudson and, and sort of to the west of James Bay. Uh, but in surface area, it covers about the size of England and France combined. Uh, I have my own word for it. I like to call it the water world because it's more water than land. If you're flying overhead in a helicopter, it looks something like a giant swampy labyrinth of different passageways, something like this, a giant maze. And as I said, it's more water than land. And I've been doing expeditions there since I was a teenager now. Uh, hiking, camping, and canoeing. And if you're thinking to yourself, in that list of verbs he just used, did he say hiking? Because this doesn't look like the kind of landscape uh, you'd want to go hiking in. Uh, well, you'd be absolutely correct about that. <laughs> uh, but probably my favorite, 
my favorite fact of all about the Hudson Bay Lowlands, maybe why it's so appealing. I don't know if you found this uh, or if you're familiar with this, but the Hudson Bay Lowland in July has the distinction of having the world's highest concentration of blood sucking insects. <laughs> yeah, all that bog uh, makes wonderful mosquito breeding ground. And I can try to use my, my, uh, my writing skills to describe that and to paint a visual picture for you to conjure up an image of clouds of mosquitoes and black flies and sand flies. Uh, but you know, they, 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 it's like they say, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'll take a, show you a picture I took a few years ago so you can get a sense of that. Yeah. <laughs> lots and lots of mosquitoes. Now, I always, uh, I always try to be positive. You know, I think there's a silver lining in everything. I like to be optimistic and upbeat. So in all of my journeys, you know, if I've been out in the swamps for weeks, I haven't seen another human for a month. Uh, you know, I've, I've lost 20 pounds by hacking through this stuff. I say there's a silver lining in everything, even clouds of mosquitoes. And the silver lining I found in that is that after months of hacking through swamps, uh, you're often very hungry and with that heavy backpack on, you're huffing and puffing and breathing hard. And I find that I just start to inhale those mosquitoes. <laughs> And that's just extra protein, extra calories. So there is a good upside of everything. Uh, anyway, so if you are curious, and I don't think any of you are curious, I'm looking around the room and I think you're all kindred spirits. Uh, you love geography, you love biology, you love the outdoors. Uh, but every once in a while, I give an invitation. Uh, every once in a while, I have a teacher at a school email me and say, would you like to come talk to my classroom or my school? And they'll often, you know, they'll, they'll preface the remarks by saying something along the lines of, uh, you know, we're really concerned nowadays uh, about nature deficit disorder. The kids nowadays, they don't like the out outdoors. They don't go outside for anything. Uh, they're all addicted to their screens, right? Their phones, their tablets, their video games, their computers. Maybe you can come and, and, and share some of your passion for the outdoors and get them inspired. And that's what I try to do when I go to those schools and talk to the youngsters. I try to get them, you know, excited to go outside and make memories that they will never forget. <laughs> so put down those video games and go experience the majesty of the great outdoors. Uh, but if you are curious, I mean, if those kids are curious, if anyone's curious, you know, what do I enjoy the most about doing my journeys for months? I said I'm getting ready to go on another four-month journey solo. Uh, the thing that I love most, I mean, I love trees. I'm obsessed with trees. I was just doing a project where I was looking for like one of the biggest... Uh, Biggest trees of different species in in Ontario, you know, tulip trees and uh, uh, white pines, and red pines. I mean, it's so much fun looking for these centuries-old giants off the beaten track. And uh, I love mushrooms. I have a long-term ambition to write a field guide to mushrooms in Canada. I've been working on it for over ten years, and it's a lifelong project of mine. Uh, but maybe what I love most about my journeys, you know, the thing that sticks most often in my mind uh, when I look back at on. It's just encountering different wild animals. I mean, I think there's something special about that, almost magical. So when I look back on the different journeys and adventures I've had, uh, the memories that are freshest in my mind are like when I'm in the middle of the swamp and I've been out there for weeks, I haven't seen another person and I'm struggling through and I look over my left shoulder and what do I see perched in the branches of this black spruce with this beautiful, you know, impossibly large, majestic bald eagle and there's no one else around, just the eagle and me and we're we're making eye contact and we're looking at each other and it's almost a magical moment. I mean, I love these kind of encounters. Uh, one of my favorite animals to, to meet with, to brush up against on my journeys are these guys here. I love uh, getting to see wolves up close in the wild. And I always say this is one of the advantages of traveling on your own, going solo. Uh, I found, you know, I do guided trips every once in a while. I just took a group of, of high school students up north for their first ever camping trip. It was wonderful. It turned out to be minus 24. They had a great time. <laughs> you know, I'm doing my best, my own small part to get kids passionate about the outdoors, as you can see. Uh, but I was, you know, I find that when you travel in a group, uh, your opportunities to see wildlife diminish. Whereas when you're by yourself, and if you resist the urge to talk to yourself, you're a little more quiet. <laughs> you get these uh, magical moments where you can have a wolf come up to you. And I've met with many wolves on my, my travels, a lot of other ones. This was a female wolf in the Northwest Territories. And she was kind of on a lake shore and she saw me and she came over to me and looked at me for a while and i took her picture uh, before she left so i love crossing paths with wolves and caribou and because i travel in such remote isolated places to tell you the truth i really don't even work that hard to get these pictures i don't have a zoom lens or anything like that 
Uh, many of the animals, they're actually nice enough just to come uh, right outside my tent. Let me take the picture there, as you can see. So it's always a nice thing, isn't it? Just before you're going to bed. Uh, anyways, that's a little bit about me and what I do, what I'm passionate about. Uh, this afternoon, I figured I would talk to you maybe a little bit about my, uh, my newest book. It's only about four or five months old. It came out last fall. It's called Beyond the Trees. If I was a proper salesman rather than an adventurer, I would have brought a copy and held it up now. And then I would have had copies for sale, but I neglected to do either of those things. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you'll just imagine it here. It's got a really pretty cover, uh, Beyond the Trees. And uh, it's the story of uh, one of the, the bigger projects I've undertaken, one of the bigger journeys I've done. And uh, to tell you how I came up with the idea, I have to spin the clock back a few years. I would say 2016 or so. I was living in northern Ontario at the time in Sudbury. And... Uh, uh, I was uh, hearing more and more about uh, Canada 150 projects, projects for the 150th anniversary of Confederation. There was a whole multitude of things going on. Every little group and club seemed to be doing something. And I started to think, well, maybe we shouldn't be focused on the last 150 years. Maybe we should focus on the next 150 years. And what uh, is Canada going to look like a century and a half from now? You know, is there still going to be vast wild places or is all that forest going to be cleared for logging? Um, is everything going to be changing through climate? You know, what's it going to look like in 150 years? Forget about the past. The past is over and done with. I know, a horrible thing for someone to say, writes history books for a living. But forget <laughs> about that. And let's think about the future. And that's what I started to do. You know, I was looking at the map of Canada. I was looking at population growth. I was looking at the, the expansion of the road network, tens of thousands of different paved roads and mines and things and logging frontiers. And I was looking at all this. And I started to wonder, well, what could I do in 2017 uh, to mark the occasion maybe to, to spark some interest in the wild, all these things that I love, wild places and wild animals. And I was looking at the map here, and I, was, I should have put another map in, but I didn't. But I was looking at wild places around the world. And I think it's really extraordinary, and I don't think very many Canadians know this, uh, but the biggest roadless area, this is population density, maybe I should explain that, uh, but the biggest roadless area anywhere in the world outside of Antarctica as of the 21st century is this big portion of Canada's north here. This is really special. It's one of the only places in the world uh, where you can still wander for thousands of kilometers and never cross a single road or highway. I mean, if you look at wild places around the world, you could, there's this, uh, this peer-reviewed science study that's updated every five years or so showing the shrinking wild places around the world. It's really alarming. You look at the Amazon, it's amazing how fast it's going, or Southeast Asia, or Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but this area here, I mean, it's the biggest roadless wild place anywhere in the world outside of Antarctica. I mean, from basically the Dempster Highway over here, as of right now, you can still travel by canoe or on foot uh, thousands of kilometers all the way over to the coast of Hudson Bay without crossing a single road or highway. Now, that might not, that might not last for very much longer. Uh, the Trudeau government has actually approved plans. They promised $61 million of taxpayers' money uh, to build a road for a Chinese mining company from Yellowknife up here so they can mine up here. But anyways, as of right now, this still exists in its wild state. So I thought to myself, well, why not, if it's possible, give it my best shot to go all the way across that by myself in my canoe in a single Arctic summer. You know, canoe alone across the Arctic, pretty logical plan. It's probably crossed everyone's mind at least once <laughs> or twice. You're laughing because I stole your idea. You're going to totally do that until I came along. And uh, that was the idea I came up with. And when I first started planning and preparing, I mean, I've done lots of canoe trips in the north before. I canoed up in the high Arctic up here near V Count Melville Sound. I've done some expeditions over here uh, along uh, the Deese River, sort of up in this area, and elsewhere across the north all over in Hudson Bay. Uh, but I figured, you know, why not try to do this journey? And being geographers, you probably already know, well, that's not a good idea at all. Why would you do a journey horizontally across that map? And if you look at a more detailed map, you can figure out why that's maybe a problem. Uh, if you're going to do a journey alone across the Arctic from west to east, or if you start in the Hudson Bay watershed and you come over here to the Bering Sea watershed, uh, there's a big problem with that, that idea. And that's because it turns out that most of the rivers in the north are not flowing the right direction for this project. As you can clearly see here, most of these rivers are all draining north into the Beaufort Sea or the Arctic Ocean. So if you want to do a journey along the Arctic Circle down here, but well, you're going to run into a lot of rivers that aren't going the right direction. Uh, but I, you know, I racked my brain, I did some homework, and I came up with what I thought would be the best plan for me, uh, the most economically feasible plan uh, for me to pull this off. I figured I'd start over here in the Richardson Mountains in May, 
and I'd do the first couple hundred kilometers on foot, get through those mountains while things were still frozen, and then come out of the mountains and hit the Mackenzie River here, just outside of Sigachik. And Sigachik, I planned to pick up my canoe, my paddles, my life jacket, my barrels, and then paddle as fast as I could go east, roughly along the Arctic Circle. And I was hoping to get all the way over to Baker Lake Nunavut down there uh, before conditions got a little too cold for paddling in September or whenever the snows might start to accumulate. So that was my plan. Oh shoot, what can I slide show? I don't know why there's a picture of me there. That's just a random picture. Uh, <laughs> anyways, this is where I started. <laughs> I started in the Richardson Mountains. Has anyone ever been to the Richardson Mountains? Yes? Oh wow, you've been everywhere. You too. Uh, they're, I think, one of the most beautiful mountain ranges in the world. It's one of the only places in Canada that wasn't glaciated during the last uh, ice age. So they have this very dreamlike ice age appearance, these thin, wispy clouds, uh, beautiful sort of undulating dunes. And I started there, and uh, I started on foot, as I said, right on the Arctic Circle, and my plan was very simple to go east. Uh, with all the backtracking, because I can't travel in a perfectly straight line, that wouldn't be very feasible. Uh, I had to have to do about 4,000 kilometers total to get all the way over to my end point. And I was traveling as light as possible, you know, moving through the mountains in May, uh, I had just a backpack and the bare essentials. Uh, and I figured if, you know, a lot of people say when you're traveling in the north, who, who's actually, has anyone ever camped in polar bear territory before? A few of you? <laughs> yeah. And did you carry, did you carry firearms when you did that? Yes, you're all naughty. Uh -huh. Well, on my journey, I decided not to carry any firearms because I had to travel as light as possible. And in my experience, I'd encountered many polar bears, many grizzly bears, uh, many black bears. And I always found that, you know, most bears... Uh, when you get right down to it, they don't really want any trouble. Uh, they seem more scared of me than I am of them, and they always seem to run away. And I figured, how many bears am I realistically going to meet with on this journey? So I didn't carry any uh, any firearms on my journey. I did take a care of a bear spray uh, from Canadian Tire and White Horse before I left there. Anyways, I think it was about 40 minutes into my 4,000-kilometer trek <laughs> when I came across some fresh tracks. Uh, down in the gravel there, and I should have a picture, but I guess I don't. Uh, but I came across some fresh tracks uh, down in the gravel. They were pretty big, you know, I was impressed by the size of them and the stride of this animal it had an enormous stride. And uh, yeah, they sunk down about half an inch, so I figured that animal must have weighed about five or 600 pounds to do that. Uh, and normally when we think of the Arctic and we think of bears, we think of polar bears, they're the icon of the north, but I was looking at these tracks and I knew there's no way these are the tracks of a polar bear. And the reason for that is very simple. There are no polar bears up in the Richardson Mountains. Uh, as many of you no doubt know, uh, polar bears, they don't like to come too far inland. They like to stay down near the salt water because obviously that's where their favorite food uh, is to be found, the seals. I mean, normally you don't find them much more than 100 kilometers inland or so. Uh, so I know that it could be the tracks of a polar bear, uh, but in fact, it's the tracks of kind of the distant cousin of the polar bear, uh, which is the Arctic grizzly. And at that time of year, the Arctic grizzlies are just starting to wake up from their long winter's nap and come out of their caves and come down the mountain slopes. Uh, I was committed, so I had to keep hiking along. I followed these tracks for a few hundred yards. Then they kind of veered off to the right. Uh, they disappeared into a thicket of willow. I looked across the thicket, and I saw what had been making the tracks on the other side. I saw a big Arctic grizzly uh, with his back to me. He had his back to me. He must have been pretty hungry because he was actually munching on the little willow shoots. And then on the breeze, I could see him sort of sniffing on the wind. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you think that's funny. I didn't think it's funny. <laughs> uh, he was sniffing on the wind, and I could see him cranking his head around in my direction. He turned around. He saw me. He rose up on his hind legs, stood about eight or nine feet tall, and then he dropped down on all fours, and he immediately charged me. Now, I've been told that I only have about an hour, so those are the kind of boring details that are in my book, if you want to know how that ended. <laughs> we'll just skip ahead to the more important stuff, because you're geographers, you're like, we don't care about those kind of stories. Keep it keep it academic here, okay. So anyways, yeah, if you want to know how that ended, uh, you can read my book, anyways. Um, <laughs> so after a few hundred kilometers of hiking, you know, over a period of days, I eventually get out of the Richardson Mountains, and I come down to the banks of the Mackenzie River, uh, where my plan was to rendezvous with my canoe, my paddles, my life jacket, uh, my two barrels, my watertight plastic barrels, you guys know those things, and uh, start paddling. Uh, I was hoping, I was actually hoping that I would have an ice, you know, a little bit earlier ice melt so I could get across. I've been looking at all this ice melt data over the last 30 years in the Western Arctic. Then it didn't really turn out to be an early ice melt at all. They were saying it was the latest ice melt in 30 years. And when I saw that ice on the river, I was a little bit apprehensive uh, about paddling 
uh, on the water when it was so choked with ice. Before I left home, I, I watched a movie. It's called uh, Titanic. <laughs> so I had a pretty good idea what ice can do to a boat. But by June 1st, most of the ice had cleared on the Mackenzie River. I was able to put my canoe in the water and uh, start paddling. Uh, paddling upstream because I don't want to go downstream. If I follow, if I let the current take me, it's going to carry me out to the Beaufort Sea uh, with the beluga whales and polar bears, and not really conducive to my plan. So I turned around and started going upstream, you know, paddling against the current. And the current is pretty strong there, especially early in the year after the ice melt and it's swollen. Uh, paddling as hard as I could with all my gear now loaded into my canoe, about 170 pounds worth of gear. I could only travel at a rate of about one kilometer an hour. And I did the math on my 4,000 kilometer route and it wasn't looking so promising. Um, so I experimented with different methods like hiking along the shore with a harness and uh, dragging the canoe down below. That was a little bit faster, but I found the only method I could really use solo by myself to get upstream against that current uh, was cutting down a trembling aspen and taking all the branches off the trembling aspen, making a pole of about 10 or 11 feet in length and then standing upright in the canoe, balancing in the canoe, and then with the pole pushing off the river bottom and pushing off the bottom. I should have a picture of that. I don't know where it disappeared to. Um, but anyways, if you buy my book, I've got pictures in the center, and you can see a picture of me pulling in there. Uh, there was still a lot of ice piled up on the shore. You can see all this dirty ice. And as the ice was melting, as May turned to June, uh, it could create big uh, mudslides or landslides that would come into the river where the banks collapsed. And uh, when that would happen, I couldn't, I couldn't go uh, around them because if I went out deeper into the river, I wouldn't be able to reach bottom. So I found the only method I could use, and I find this is often the way in life, you know, hard work is the only thing that's going to get you through, uh, was to take my hiking boots off, roll up my pants, and uh, start dragging the canoe through the mud until I got to deeper water. And then I could continue. At night, I just set up my little tent, you know, traveling light. As I said, I set up my little tent wherever it was a safe spot. And I'd be pretty exhausted, especially since time was critical, right? I'm moving as fast as I can go because I don't want to only have to get halfway across and have the snow bury me in the fall. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be very successful. So I'm moving as fast as I can go, which means no stopping for breakfast, no stopping for lunch. My food was just high energy calorie bars so I can eat on the fly and move as fast as I could go. At night, you know, I'd be exhausted. So I'd fall asleep in my tent. And I'd usually sleep, sleep pretty soundly in my sleeping bag. Uh, every once in a while, I would have that experience that I'm sure many of you can relate to. Uh, you know when you're sleeping out in the wilderness and it's the middle of the night and something wakes you up just outside your tent. Yes, you're nodding. You've had that happen to you. Like you hear a branch snap or the leaves rustle and you think, what could be making that sound? I always say, you know, confidence is half the battle. Be optimistic. So I usually tell myself whenever that happens to me, uh, which seems to be quite often, uh, that the odds are it's probably only a red squirrel making that noise. Uh, but it can be a little bit alarming when you unzip the screen door of your tent just to peek out and see what's making that noise out there. And you see one of these guys like five feet away just staring right back at you. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty big. Uh -huh. uh, so I just kind of got used to nocturnal disturbances in my sleep. I would have bears wake me up. I'd have these guys wake me up, parked as mox hawks. Uh, but I only wanted to go about 350 kilometers up the Mackenzie River. When I got to that point, I was continuing along the Arctic Circle, so I left it behind. I started going up a smaller tributary, uh, looks something like this. So I'm still traveling against the current. Uh, you can see I'm wearing neoprene, so I don't have to worry about hypothermia because whenever there's whitewater rapids, then I just get down in the river, drag the canoe behind me there. And uh, I did this for another several weeks or so, and I was hoping eventually to get into Great Bear Lake. Uh, I'm sure you all know Great Bear Lake as geographers and biologists, uh, eighth largest body of water in the world, bigger than two of the Great Lakes, about 31,153 square kilometers of open water. I figured if I could get to the sort of northwest arm of the lake, that would be my ticket for almost 500 kilometers of paddling. It would take me out of the Northwest Territories and almost into Nunavut, which would be very good. So that's where I was hoping to get to. Uh, I followed this stream all the way up until there was no more water to follow. You know, eventually there was some black spruce obstructing it, some log jams. Uh, but when I ran out of water, that's when the really hard work began because that's when I have to start uh, traveling on foot and portaging. Uh, so I might, you know, begin with my backpack here. My backpack's got my, my hatchet in it, my first aid kit, my tripod, my camera equipment, uh, all that kind of stuff. So I would hike east for about three kilometers or so. I wasn't too worried about navigating. No trail or path to follow, of course, but I know that the coast of Great Bear Lake, it's so massive, it's like the ocean. 
I can't possibly miss it so long as I keep going east. So I would hike for about three kilometers or so. After about three kilometers of hiking, you know, the ground might be uh, marshy in places, might be willow thickets and others, dwarf birch, uh, you name it. Uh, I would set down uh, my backpack and then retrace my steps another three kilometers or six kilometers and get the first of my barrels, my blue barrel, uh, with all my food rations strapped out on me, carry it nine kilometers back to where I left my backpack, set that down, come all the way back, try not to get lost, get my other barrel, my orange barrel with more food rations, carry that all the way back, uh, 18 kilometers or so, go all the way back and uh, get my canoe and then drag the canoe for the last load, save always the hardest for last, drag that all the way across. Uh, so that means when I was doing my portages between different watersheds, because I started in the Bering Sea watershed, trying to get the Hudson's Bay watershed, uh, with my four loads, it would be seven times the amount on a map to actually cover the distance with all my different loads. So a three kilometer portage, uh, when you're by yourself with four loads is in fact 21 kilometers of portaging. Uh, the upside of that is that when you finally do reach water, it just feels all the more sweet to get there. Yeah. And uh, when I got to the big water, um, because as you can tell, I don't like taking risks, I found the safest way to do things uh, was to travel by night. So I'd usually be nocturnal. I would sleep during the day and then paddle all night long under the midnight sun as you can see here. The reason I did that, very simple, is the waves, the wind are usually worse during the day when you have all those warm air currents. Uh, so that's why I would do most of my paddling by night and sleep during the day when there was big white caps uh, wriggling those lakes. There were still some obstacles uh, outside my control as I was moving along uh, the coast of, of, of Great Bear Lake over a period of many days. Uh, I came around sort of a peninsula on that north shore and I saw something that made my heart for a moment sink a little. I saw this a lot of ice uh, blocking my route. And this ice was still pretty thick. I mean, down here, this is about four or five inches thick, so you can stand on it. But as you can see, there's also open water. So I didn't really want to go walking across the ice, dragging my canoe behind me. And I couldn't get around it because it extended for miles offshore. And I didn't really want to venture way out there into the heart of the lake, especially if the wind picks up. But I couldn't afford to delay either. Uh, so I had to find a way to snake through this maze of ice. I found my pole very useful here. I used my pole to sort of push into the ice flows or push up onto them. You know, the edges were often uh, sort of slushy like that, so I could get up onto the flow. And then the center, the center part would usually have that thicker uh, white ice. I'll play you a little video if it works here. I don't know if it's, I can't promise. Oh, yes, here's my GoPro. And it will look something like this, as you can see. And I kept going through the ice, you know, over a period of days. I was usually looking for the path of least resistance, wherever the ice was a little bit weaker. I would head for that area because then I could at least sit in the canoe and uh, use my paddle to jab at that ice, break it up, create little leads or openings, and uh, paddle through. If you're wondering about the mental side of my journey, you know, psychologically, what was your mental state? You're alone for months. You haven't seen another human being. What kind of effect does that have on you? Uh, now, when you go in front of a group of people, do you just seize up? <laughs> Don't know what to say. Uh, well, I, was, I didn't really feel lonely. And I did feel lonely because, of course, I had the company of wild animals and birds along my route. I mean, I love birds. So every night inside my tent, I'd made a little list of all the birds I was hearing, like yellow warblers or the birds I'd seen during the day, like sandhill cranes or uh, hooded mergansers or snowy owls or peregrine falcons. I'd made a list of all this stuff. And uh, having animals keep me company, you know, it always put a smile on my face, an extra spring in my step when I would see I had company out there. Uh, this wolf, he was very curious. He followed me along for about a kilometer and a half or so. And uh, many of the caribou, you know, they would come by and say hi. Uh, Sandhill Cranes, one of my favorite birds, one of the biggest birds native to Canada. I always say they're kind of like a great blue heron on steroids. Uh, little Arctic ground squirrels would keep me company. And every once in a while, I'd have a visitor in the middle of the night. I'd have a bear come by and wake me up, so it keep me on my toes. And uh, one of the great challenges but rewards of my journey was the astonishing diversity of different landscape or terrain I was traveling through. You know, sometimes 
wide open tundra as far as the eye can see, and then little narrow canyons cut into the earth, uh, you know, obstacles to get around. Some places impossibly beautiful, uh, you know, an abundance of wildflowers, all these different colors of the rainbow, purple and yellow and white. Other places more stony and barren, uh, you know, not as much vegetation and not the most comfortable place to sleep in the world. Other places look almost like the Scottish Highlands, these beautiful green hills, uh, wide open deserts, uh, just blowing white sand and sand dunes, miles and miles and miles. I feel like, you know, I was in the Sahara Desert as I was traversing across those uh, beautiful snowy mountains, thundering cataracts, uh, big icebergs. Here's a really big iceberg just drifting around out there. And all these different landscapes created different uh, challenges to navigate and travel over. Uh, sometimes if I come to a sandy creek, I could get down in it, drag the canoe behind me. That wasn't too hard, but as I'm sure you geographers know, uh, with all that sandy soil, uh, the water has cut a great many meanders, uh, big S bends or meanders through there. And you know that feeling you get when you've been dragging a canoe up a river in the north for weeks and it feels like you're going around in circles. Uh, I'll show you on the satellite all the meanders on this river so you can see I'm not kidding. <laughs> uh, but that's still a lot easier than portaging. My biggest portage was to get out of the Great Bear Lake watershed which drains down into the Mackenzie, and to get over into the Coppermine River watershed. Now that portage is about 40 kilometers in total, and I'm carrying my canoe over my head there over a rocky stretch. But as I said, there's an upside, uh, a positive to everything. And after all of that portaging over multiple days, I was just all the more happy when I reached the water. And that was definitely a bonus. As I'm moving along, I get down into the Coppermine River watershed. Some of you I heard worked in the Coppermine River Copper mine, as you know, uh, has a very strong current on it, right? Especially down in its lower section there. And the current there was so strong, uh, I couldn't actually use my pole, especially where it was deep. I mean, I used it in certain sections on the copper mine, but here I just have to leap from boulder to boulder and kind of use my canoe to balance myself so I stay steady. Uh, in places where the, where the boulders are just a little too big for jumping, uh, then I would use my rope tied onto the bow, you can see it there. I'd go ahead on foot and then drag the canoe down below, you know, guide it around these cliffs so I can get back down in it. There were a few places on the copper mine where the rocks were a little too big for my rope. <laughs> Again, I'm glad you find that funny, I didn't. <laughs> uh, but as I'm doing this journey, you know, the landscape's always changing. Sometimes I might find myself right down in the middle of a stream, uh, you know, just balancing on boulders. They could be a little bit wet, a little bit slick. I might have to get down in the water and just sort of shuffle my way forward. I'll show you another video. Uh, so you can get a sense of it. Just dragging my canoe upstream here. I was a little bit worried about the damage that was accumulating in the bottom of my canoe. You know, a lot of dragging over ice and rocks that started to take a toll on the canoe. Uh, the other thing that was hard about this is this river bottom is not sandy at all. It's just all different crevices and jagged rocks. Uh, so after dragging my canoe all the way upstream there, my toes weren't looking so nice. Uh, but on the other hand, the scenery was just gorgeous, just beautiful, right? And I paddle across one big lake, you know, kind of uh, battling the headwinds, land on shore, then carry all my stuff up and over the rocks to get to the next lake and resume paddling, crossing paths with herds of mux oxen. After about three months, I was pretty hungry. You know, I was shedding a lot of weight, uh, just traveling 13, 12 hours a day as fast as I could go. So I gathered as many wild edibles as I could find, cloudberries and lingonberries and crowberries and bearberries and arctic blueberries. At least I didn't have to worry about navigating at all because I had topographic maps, and those are really simple and effective. As you can see, nothing to worry about there. <laughs> And of course, I couldn't afford to take the wrong lake or go down a dead end bay because I'm running out of time now. As you know, by the end of August, just like here in Waterloo, uh, in the middle of October here, all those oaks and maples start to change red and orange. Same thing happens on the Arctic tundra. You get the fall colors. 
and the seasons start to change. There's other signs of the changing seasons. Sun's starting to dip below the horizon. Uh, the nights are getting colder. Now there's a layer of frost on my tent. The snow geese, they start to migrate south, as do a lot of the caribou down to the boreal forest. And in the Hudson Bay watershed, especially, it uh, becomes storm season. With really powerful winds. I mean, you have gale force winds, thunder and lightning storms. Uh, those kind of storms, they can generate wind uh, with waves big enough to sweep right over your canoe. Anyways, that's about all the time we have. So if you want to know how that ended, you've got to read, there's my book, uh, Beyond the Trees. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. So I think I did succeed in leaving a little bit of time for questions. Do we have right until two or are people about to get out of here to go to your yeah. next class or something? Okay. We've got time for, okay. uh, for questions from the audience. Okay. Is there any, uh, any questions at all? No, everyone's still kind of boring. Okay. <laughs> what was your footwear of choice dealing with all wet of it and the dry open tundra and the rain? So that's a good question. I carried two pairs of footwear. Uh, I had my hiking boots. I think they're uh, keen hiking boots. They're nice and wide, easy on your feet. Uh, that was for traveling, you know, in between on the rocks and stuff and portaging. And then when I was in the canoe and I was in the water, uh, I had a pair of neoprene waders. Uh, just to keep my feet nice and dry and then when i was portaging i would usually just strap those onto the outside of my barrel so those worked pretty well until they were punctured and then all that cold water would flood into them which would kind of feel kind of nice on my toes but that's what i did there uh, any other uh, questions yes um when you complete your trip after you kind of you you, you were successful in, in doing this trip of probably one thousand kilometers and all the preparation that's gone into that do you go through sort of a grieving process that it's over, or are you just super excited about the next thing? Uh, well, I should ask, has anyone, has anyone by any chance read my book, Beyond the Trees? But you have. I, I, okay, because I, I was like, yes. that sounds like you've read my book. I, yeah. I, I spoilers. Have, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so you know <laughs> the. Spoiler yeah, spoiler alert. Come on. Was, <laughs> really uh, well, yeah, as you know, the ending of my book is sort of bittersweet. There's a touch of melancholy in it, and I talk about. You know, all these things I love, all the animals and things, and uh, definitely it's bittersweet. There's a part of me uh, that would say, no, I'm not coming to Laurier. I'm not doing any more slideshows. I'm just going to stay out there uh, doing what I love. Uh, but I feel like, you know, I have to. Uh, you can't be selfish like that. There's a part of me that definitely just wants to go away like that. But, you know, uh, the other side of it is, is you have to try to try to, you know, spread the message and do what you can. Uh, I was an environmental columnist for about five or six years. I wrote a, a column on environmental issues. And I feel like after six years of being involved in petitions and things and different environmental groups and lobbying different levels of government, I accomplished nothing at all. It seemed like we never actually accomplished anything. And I was only ever preaching to the choir. And then I started deciding, well, what if I did a more subtle roundabout way? And I instead of you know, hitting people over the head with it, I told stories of adventure, of wild animals, of magical bald eagles, of ancient forests, you know, a bird song, of majestic lakes. And I did this in a more subtle way to sort of, you know, try to get in there and show them the, the immense value of these places. And maybe on some level, when they're finished reading my book, uh, they'll come away with a little bit of feeling of that. And then they'll want to go out and uh, delve into all those other uh, groups and articles and things and get more involved. So that was kind of the bittersweet note. Uh, at the end of my end of my book, and there's a little bit of an afterward there, in which I talked briefly in my afterward uh, of about more of an environmental uh, message in the end there. So that's kind of my approach to things, my meandering way. Uh, any other uh, questions? Yes. I don't really understand my question. When you were starting out, like, what's your mental situation there? Like, how do you? There's a lot of unknown, a lot of apprehension. Absolutely. There was a lot of unknowns. I, I, you know, I did a lot of canoe tripping in the Arctic and elsewhere before this. and I read everything I could lay my hands on. I heard many stories from different people. And the big, the big unknown that always uh, sort of nagged at me at the back of my mind was the wind. You know, I've read stories of different people on canoe trips who the wind, uh, the wind had, had pinned them down on shore for 12 days at a stretch. This one 1972 uh, trip, they got pinned down by the wind at the end of August in the Hudson Bay watershed. For 12 days, you know, the night and day, the wind was relentless, and the wind can be so strong. I remember another story I heard uh, once of a canoeing party in the Arctic. There was about, uh, I think, uh, oh, a party of about eight divided over four canoes, and overnight, the wind was just like, you know, fierce on their tents, like a racket all night long, 
And when they woke up the next morning and they went outside, one of their canoes was gone. The wind had carried it away in the night, right? Which it can happen. And when it was really bad, I would like pile rocks inside my canoe or tie it down to anything I could find. Uh, so I was very apprehensive about the wind. And in the beginning, I gave myself, you know, I didn't know if I could succeed. I figured it was a coin toss, 50-50, if the wind went against me. I mean, you got to you gotta just kind of count on luck some of the time. But I figured you only live once. And uh, if I don't try, I'm sure... You know, years from now, when I'm looking back, I'll be like, oh, you know, I, I never I never tried, and now I'm too old for it. So I figured I don't want to have that regret. It's better to try my hardest and fail uh, than not try at all. So that was my idea, yes. Uh, any other questions? Yes. When you're on these journeys, and, and you know, this is modern day, you have modern equipment, um, does it dawn you when you're going through these areas, thinking back to when the early explorers did this, but... You know, birch bark and the seals get how they how they manage does it is it yes absolutely uh i think about the technol technological change all the time specific to canoes and paddles and life jackets and all these things and it's actually a great motivator because i always say ah oh, i've got it easy <laughs> you know if they could do this hundreds of years ago uh i have it easy with these modern materials i mean i love birch bark canoes as you saw uh building birch bark canoes they're an ingenious a vessel, but you just can't use them in the same way. If you try to drag it across an ice or drag it over rocks or put a hole right through it, first thing. And if you if you ever have spent any time in a birch bark canoe or maybe just read historic accounts of them, uh, you know repairing your canoe is a daily thing, sometimes multiple times in a day. Uh, so you'd always want to carry an extra supply of birch bark. And if you're traveling beyond the trees on the tundra where the nearest birch big enough to make a canoe out of is hundreds of kilometers away, it makes it even more challenging. And all the other advantages I have, I mean, I have Under Armour, uh, you know, Gore-Tex and neoprenes that don't have to worry about hypothermia, uh, these really high calorie energy bars, you know, all these things uh, make it so much easier than if you were trying to use uh, just traditional materials. I mean, I guess that's true of any walk of life. I mean, if you're thinking about your own research, I sometimes think like, wow, I can't imagine what it would have been like to do a PhD in like 1975 without the internet and without a laptop and <laughs> have to write all this stuff out. And you know, go to the library and go to a card catalog. And I think that's true of any any walk of life of, of how much technology has changed. I mean, even in archaeology, we talk about how much more sophisticated methods and technologies have become today compared to what they were, uh, you know, 50 or 100 years ago. So I think that's very true of, of everything. Is that our technology has made it a little bit easier. And uh, I guess for me, it's just a mo another motivating factor. If I feel like I'm in over my head, I'm like, oh, come on. Uh, you've got it easy compared to what people had in the past. So yes, there is an element of that. Uh, any other further questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, was there, like, did you have any like, planning place or something went wrong? Like, you broke a bone or all your equipment went down the street or something? Yes, yes. Uh, I thought about that, th that quite often throughout the day. <laughs> uh, and it would depend on the scenario. Um, if I mean, I was trying my hardest not to give up, even if I if something had happened to me. Um, if I broke a bone, like I, let's say I, I twisted my ankle really bad, or I broke my ankle and I couldn't go on, um, I would probably have devised a new route uh, to give up traveling upstream and simply go with the current down to the nearest community that I could get to, uh, which might be difficult, but compared to going upstream, it would feel at least easier. And uh, that would be my plan in that scenario. Uh, you know, I did think if I, I did often think, well, what happens if a bear destroys all my food in the night or my canoe is destroyed? Uh, what am I going to do here? Because I was thinking of, well, how much would it cost hypothetically if I had to get a helicopter or something to drop me something new? And I did the math on my head and it was uh, very uh, forbidding that option. <laughs> and uh, So I was just really hoping that uh, to be as careful as possible and not have any of that happen. I mean, I, I like to joke about it, but I'm actually uh, very, very cautious about everything I do out there. You know, I'm always thinking of the worst case scenario, and I think ahead of time, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? And then I'm prepared for it mentally. So every morning when I wake up and I unzip my tent, I'll be like, okay, guaranteed. When I look outside my tent, my bear will be like this mangled remains strewn about, and all the food will be gone because the bear has come. Uh, or guaranteed, the next you know piece of ice or rock that hits this canoe is going to go straight through it. Uh, just to sort of be prepared psychologically for whatever happens. Uh, any further questions? Yes. Um, I imagine you have a very understanding family. <laughs> um, so could you speak to me a little about to how this impacts like your relationship and if you ever feel like kind of guilt 
Uh, because, like, the impact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, when I did that, I was single. I wasn't married. Um, so there wasn't really too much thought about any of that. Uh, now, I am married now. And uh, my, my wife was actually like, I definitely think you should go on a four-month journey this spring. <laughs> <laughs> Only four months? Are you sure you don't want to raise the bar higher? Um, so it's been pretty good. Uh, no, she's actually very supportive of me. Uh, I mean, she knew she knew what she was getting into uh, when she met me because I'd already done these journeys. Um, but no, no, she doesn't worry about that at all. She worries much more about, like, you're going where today? You're driving all the way to Waterloo? Well, you be careful. Don't you daydream on that road like you do, or the roads are bad. You know, I worry much more about that when I have to drive somewhere or something like that. So she's very supportive. I'm supportive of her. And, uh, yeah, we do that kind of thing. So. Anyways, I think we're pretty much out of time. I will say one final thing. Um, I should have brought books in case you wanted one. I did not. Uh, but if you do want to pick up a copy of my book, uh, I don't know if they have it in your campus bookstore. They do. They definitely do it at the, at the Western one because I saw it there and at McMaster. So hopefully Laurier has it. If your campus bookstore doesn't have my book, uh, you can get it pretty much anywhere books are sold. I know independent bookstores in Waterloo, they do have it because they did an event with an independent bookstore here. They also have it on Indigo, on Amazon, Chapters, Coles, uh, so you can get it anywhere you like. And if you buy a book, you're supporting me uh, because I receive no salary from anyone. I don't take a salary from the RCGS. I don't take any taxpayers' money. I'm completely independent, and I self-fund all my journeys uh, through my books. So you'll support sending me on another adventure, and then maybe in a year, they'll invite me back, and I can tell you how it went. So good deal for everyone. And if you do want to find me, uh, you can find me on Instagram or Facebook, and you can keep in touch with me that way. I'm always posting cool stuff. I just posted a big a white pine the other day that I came across in the, the forest, so you can see that kind of stuff. But anyways, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. I'm on behalf of the Cold Region oh, okay. Research Center, I have a small token of appreciation. Just for what I need, another really fascinating yeah, thank, you <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Maybe I'll wear it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. My pleasure.